speaker. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Um, I wanted to talk to you as far back as February because it's so historic. I was so you know, excited when I saw that you were going to be the Speaker of the House. Has that always been a goal of yours? So I have to admit I did not run for state representative in 2015 to become Speaker of the House. However, when I was fortunate enough for my colleagues to elect me as the Democratic leader in the uh, end of 2020, certainly the goal was for us to get out of the minority uh, from 93 members and get to 102 members and certainly when we got to the majority run to be Speaker of the House. So it's a recent goal and I'm just elated. What has it been like? What was the joy? Was it February 23rd, I think? What's that been like? February 28th. So it's almost five months and it's been quite breathtaking. It's humbling. It's an honor. However, I recognize that for the time that I have it, I have a lot of hard work to do to make sure that there can be so many women that will follow. What's the biggest challenge of being the Speaker of the House? So unlike when I was the minority leader, where I got to be the caucus's cheerleader, stand at the podium and fight and shout and cheer away on all of our big issues, I have to be more neutral. I have to govern for the entire chamber, and many times it's during contentious debate. So I have to make sure I set the example of making sure the toxicity is out of the House and that people can disagree and agree to disagree, but can freely express themselves. Excellent. So you have to like referee almost. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I'm That's sure. That's it. And then you have opportunities like this when you get to go out to places in the Commonwealth outside of your district. What has that experience been like? So that is tremendous because I love my community. I'm from Southwest Philadelphia and have now spent almost 41 years in the city I love. However, when I get to go outside of my community, I get to learn about all of the similarities and quite frankly, some differences that are in other people's areas areas in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I'm here in Scranton today. I'll be here learning, seeing what's going on at the expansion of the medical school for Geisinger. And I look forward to learning. I use it as a learning opportunity to make sure everything we do in the chamber is not just a benefit for my own constituents, but for folks all across PA. And for you being the first woman, the first woman of color, I mean, do you realize while you're in it the, histor the historical significance of what this moment is for you? Absolutely. I realize it. I realize that my father's mother, my grandmother I was named after, that I never got to know because she passed when I was a toddler, Joanna McClinton, who was a domestic worker, did not complete school, that this is likely an answer to prayer she prayed. Because while it wasn't on my goal list or my agenda, I recognize it means so much for the women in the past whose shoulders I stand upon and those women who are coming in the future. What sort of legacy do you want to leave when the history books say Joanna McClinton was the first Speaker of the House and she did it, finish that sentence. She did it gracefully. She did it in a way that her leadership was respected on both sides of the aisle and that most importantly, it was effective. Uh, it means nothing to me if we cannot deliver to Pennsylvanians. And as now the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House, it's my priority every single day that I go to work to make a difference in the lives of Pennsylvanians, to make sure our policies that we pass will improve and enhance people's lives and better fund our public schools and address needs that we are able to address for the moment that we are here. Tell me about your day in Scranton because you're talking about public policy and some workforce issues and then maternal health. That's right. So here in Scranton, we're going to be talking about something that is a challenge everywhere. Uh, maternal mortality is very high for women of color all across America, and Pennsylvania is no exception. So I'm here to learn about what types of training are being provided to the medical students to make sure, as we know from Serena Williams, uh, the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest women uh, in the world, uh, was able to share sadly when she birthed her first child that she could not get the care needed, uh, that her pain was not being taken seriously. But there are institutions locally, like Geisinger, that are making sure we address this and that the disparate impact that we've seen, it decreases. And so you have two events here, is that correct? That's correct. So we have a few events here. We have a tour, then we'll have a policy gathering, uh, and then finally we'll end the day by meeting with some stakeholders, hearing what's on their minds, having a round table. I'm sure you enjoy doing events like this, getting out to the community. One last question, because I know our time is very limited. I'm looking at your hair, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Thank Let's you. Let's talk about the Crown Act. 
Right. Absolutely. So the, one of the last bills we passed before our recess was the Crown Act. That stands for creating a respectful open world for natural hair. It's very important that in Pennsylvania where our democracy was born and where freedom is taken very seriously, that we don't have any workplaces where folks are discriminated against for how their hair grows out of their head. This is a law that's passed in 22 states and two cities in Pennsylvania have adopted it locally, both Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So we're looking forward to becoming the 23rd state. Uh, when the Senate comes back in the fall, we're going to let them know it passed in a huge bipartisan way. We had almost the entire chamber vote for it. Uh, so that sends a signal to the Senate that this is something that's important to all of us. Excellent. Um, is there anything else that you want to add? I don't know how often you get to Northeast Pennsylvania. I'm sure that for some of our viewers, it may be they may not be as familiar mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. you. And so hopefully for me, I can share your story so they can get to know who is the Speaker of the House for the Commonwealth. Um, you can ask another question, <laughs> but I don't, I don't have anything um, at the okay, top so of mind. I grew up in, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. My co-anchor is a LaSalle grad. So oh, I okay. would be remiss if I did not tell you that he would want me to say nice. things about LaSalle. He hates Villanova. I know you feel differently because that's now, where you listen, went to. Listen, I went to law school, school. there, I so I actually have a love-hate relationship with Villanova. Okay. I love the degree. I did not love the experience. <laughs> and certainly, I didn't love the basketball team because um, <laughs> we're rivals. He will be happy to hear that for sure, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I wanted to be quick because I know that your time is very limited, but I want people to get a chance to know you, to see the Speaker of the House. And talk a little bit more about what it is for you. You said you're not just a cheerleader now, but it's not just standing at the, you know, mm -hmm, the head mm -hmm. of the, the um, caucus, I guess, whenever we see you there. Yes. Your job is much more, much more than that. It's not what we just see on TV. Absolutely. So being Speaker of the House to me means being a fair arbiter of our debates. Our debates are serious and heated. When we talk about changing the laws on Pennsylvania's books, everyone has to be heard. Everybody has to be able to either amend a bill or improve it. Um, they have to be able to speak on behalf of their constituencies. Uh, constituencies. There are 203 of us, and all of us have the bosses back at home. So my job is critically important because I make sure that everyone is heard, that there aren't anyone, any people who are shut down or not able to speak. Uh, I also make sure that the temperature in the room is correct, that we're expressing ourselves in a way that's respectful, that it's within the best bounds of the chamber's history. We have the oldest, uh, most uh, continuous legislative body in the nation, uh, almost 250 years old in just two years from now. So we recognize that we have a legacy. Uh, goes back to Benjamin Franklin, and it's important that we uphold the principles uh, upon which our chamber was founded and our nation was founded. So while we're in a world of Twitter and social media and people want to use, you know, sometimes funny colloquial terms, I make sure that everybody the quorum's respectful and that we are able to be on that floor in a way that makes our communities proud. Because we've had some pretty contentious issues with the state budget, of course, that being an issue, even getting a Speaker of the House and the majority of the, the Pennsylvania you know, House. Yes, there were times at the beginning of the year when folks were asking me, would it take me as long as it took uh, our United States Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy? Uh, he became Speaker before I did, but notwithstanding the delay we had, we had a couple of special elections in Allegheny County that we had to make sure were fulfilled so that everybody could be present. Once everyone was present, I ran on February 28th, and I'm so grateful to have had the support of the entire Pennsylvania House Democratic Caucus.